All right. We are uh, taking up H-428 and Act Relating to Hate Motivated Crimes and Misconduct. And there is on the Senate Judiciary webpage an amendment, draft 1.2 by Bryn Hare, Legislative Council to H-428 that the committee will now be discussing. And hopefully as witnesses come in, they can I'll remind them of where the latest draft is. This was discussed at our last time we took up the bill. And I think I'll let Bryn go through the changes. Okay. So good morning committee. Um, for the record, Bryn Hare from Legislative Council here to talk about your amendment to H-428. <clears throat> so this amendment does a couple of things. Uh, I'll just go through it quickly since it's, I think it's been a week since you looked at the House Pass version. So I'll remind the committee how this differs from the House Pass version. So section one is the hate motivated crime statute. And you'll remember um, really the only change that was made in the House version was the removal of the word maliciously. So um, the new requirement would just be that the conduct, the defendant's conduct be motivated by um, the victim's actual or perceived uh, protected characteristic as listed um, on lines 11 and 12 and 13. And you'll see what this draft does is it still strikes maliciously, but it also strikes all of those characteristics because we instead define that um, protected characteristic in subdivision three at the bottom of the page. So we're going to swap out that list of terms for the for the defined phrase protected characteristic. Um, so that's one change made by this draft. Can I ask a question about ancestry? Of course. Assuming we all have ancestors, um, how does that? So that find somewhere else. I mean, I. I'm familiar with Ancestry.com, not that I've used it, but people are finding out all kinds of things. I think of it as long last brothers. Um, so is it defined somewhere? You know, I'm not sure if it's defined in Title 13. I, I'll, I can check on that. Um, but I, because every, uh, presumably everybody has, I'm not making sense to you. I, I think of it as ethnicity. Um, yeah. In other words, it, it, you know, my ancestry is part German. Germany is not my country of origin. It's not a race. Um, and so, but if somebody were prejudiced against my ancestry, you know, country of first origin, um, that's what I thought it was. Right. It's in current law that I just, so it, I, I guess yeah. it hasn't up, but it, it does strike me as, I, I suspect it's, it's, you know, I may, um, a lot of people, uh, I may, um, you know, I found a sister through channels that I had a sister that I had no idea I had when I was in my 60s, or, yeah, 60s. So um, she's an ancestor. I don't know how that makes it a protected class or my ancestry. What I thought was my ancestry is no longer, but like Senator Bruce said, German or mine is, I believe, Italian. So, so does this mean that if, if somebody commits a crime against Philip, because they hate Germans, that it can be considered a hate crime? Uh, I think before we go too far, we probably ought to check on how this is used and what it actually means. Well, years ago, there was a lot of prejudice against French in Vermont, yeah. particularly the French that moved here from Quebec. That may be the origin of that. Um, I know in Bennington, or, uh, when I was first running for office, there was actually shows on the local radio station French because it was such an odd population of French Canadian. And there was a lot of discrimination. And against the Italians too. Yeah, yeah. So I I think we ought to, before we go too far here, at least check that out. And 
how that's been used in because it's part of current law, but it strikes me as something that <coughs> may have been written long ago. Yep, I can see if that has been interpreted by the court. It's often listed in states' anti-discrimination laws um, as a kind of similar characteristic to national origin. Um, so I'll, I'll check on that for the committee. <clears throat> so um, would you like to keep if, going? Yeah, would you please keep going? Sure. So subsection B, this is new language that didn't appear in the House version. Um, and this, I added this language at the request of Senator Sears. Um, the Ma Massachusetts ha is working on a overhaul to their hate crime statutes. And this is a part of um, a part of that bill in Massachusetts that provides that um, a victim's actual or perceived protected characteristic. Um, that need not be the sole reason for defendant's conduct or even a substantial or predominant reason for um, defendant's conduct. As long as it, uh, defendant's conduct is motivated by that protected characteristic, um, they could potentially be charged under the hate, hate motivated crime statute. The only thing about that is the word substantial. So when you say it need not be predominant or the sole reason, those make sense to me. But if you say it doesn't need to be substantial, then you're saying, in effect, it can be insubstantial, which on its face kind of indicates that it's not a large reason. Or does that make sense? Um, if, you, if you say it doesn't need to be substantial, that's bringing it down to the level where you're saying it's, it's just one factor among many um so that's the only word there that gives me pause um i mm -hmm. no because there's only two options either it's substantial or it's not substantial if it's not substantial it's weird that we're enhancing the penalty because of it right i think massachusetts is revising their laws because of the inability to use current law in Massachusetts um, effectively to deal with a lot of hate motivated crime. No, and I, th I think we get there if you don't have substantial and you have predominant or the sole reason. Yeah. Um, I, I think that would be better myself. Well, maybe some witnesses can comment yeah. on that. Okay, and then lastly is subsection C, and this just adds the definition, as I mentioned before, it replaces that list found on lines 11 through 13 um, down here as the definition of protected characteristic. So same list just appears here. And then the last change from the House pass version is that you've removed that annual report requirement that appeared in the House pass version that was in subsection B, so that does not appear in this draft. And you remember it was the um, annual report that yeah. was required to these committees based on bias incidents. And that is it. All right. All right. Um, so uh, we, we now have a number of witnesses scheduled on this bill. I thank them for being here a little bit early. Um, David Schur is, our, is scheduled to be the first witness today. And we will be dealing with draft 1.2. 1 1.2. 1 Bill. Obviously, you're welcome to speak to the. Oh, I wanted to mention one other thing. I did get an email from a constituent of Senator Balance and Senator Weitz, who, oh God, when you go there, you have to do that, and you have to do that. I had it just a second ago. Basically, he wants um, anybody. Um, His name is Noah Zorn, and he would like consideration of requiring 
those convicted of a nonviolent hate crime to attend life after hate meetings. To attend what? Life after hate meetings. Wife, W-I-F-E? Life. Life, L-I-F-E. Life after hate. Hate meetings. They're evidently similar to um, AA meetings. Oh. And add immigration status to protected class, but I think it already is. Um, and those sentenced with a violent hate crime sentenced to seven years in prison and barred from purchasing a firearm for five years of one years. I said I would mention that to the committee, and they uh, have. Yeah. And I think it, you know, I'm not sure that um, we want to go to a mandatory sentence. Really. No. Um, those are his suggestions. I think, you know, nonviolent hate crimes, maybe there should be some requirement. Flight crash. I don't think we're going to go to a mandatory minimum. David, happy to hear from you. Thank you, Senator. Uh, thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Committee. Again, for the record, David Chair with the Attorney General's Office. The Attorney General's Office does support this bill. Uh, we think it is an important step forward in making sure that where there are instances of uh, offenses that have been motivated, uh, at least in part, by uh, hatred or bias against a protect people's protected characteristics, we think it's important to be able to make sure that those crime that additional. Uh, motivation is prosecutable. And we certainly think that this is constitutional and, and we don't believe that the word maliciously um, is necessary, is, excuse me, is necessary to retain the constitutionality of the statute. Um, and again, we do think it's uh, an important innovation in part because, no, I shouldn't say innovation. Uh, this is the language we're talking about here is actually fairly common language for how um, these types of offenses are defined uh, around the country. We're certainly not unique in having a statute like this by, not by any means. I mean, we are part of the vast majority of states that have a statute like this. And maliciously is not having that extra term that arguably could impose an extra burden on prosecutions for these offenses uh, is not common around the country. And I think bringing us, re removing that word really just brings us into line with uh, common practice. I wanted to say a few words about constitutionality and I, I believe the committee has heard some of this so I'll, I'll try to be fairly brief but I do think it's important to discuss that a little bit and, um, and the case law that underlies it actually provides some powerful and important um, authority for why these types of statutes are, are necessary. I also am just now seeing, uh, and thanks to legislative council for going over it, but I am just now seeing new subsection B. Um, we, or sub, yeah, subsection B. That is language that we would support. Uh, conceptually speaking, and, and we're happy to work on tweaks that may be necessary. Another committee had a little discussion on that just now. Uh, we do think that that is an important uh, change as well and also brings us into line with states that are doing their best to um, deter this type of behavior and to hold people to account for it. A, a way that some states do it is to simply say, or sorry, I should, let me say specifically California, for example, simply says whether something is motivated in whole or in part. Uh, and they, you know, to imitate the California way, they would have put that into subsection A is motivated in whole or in part by the victim's actual perceived protected characteristic. I'm not suggesting that we have to do it exactly the same way, just noting that that concept that you're embodying in subsection B is also something that happens elsewhere and that we do think is a uh, useful and helpful way to make this statute more usable in Vermont and again, hopefully hold people to account for this type of behavior. Um, Again, these types of laws have been established as constitutional by the United States Supreme Court. The seminal case in this 
area is Wisconsin versus Mitchell. And Wisconsin versus Mitchell did hold that these types of statutes where there is a crime that has happened, um, and then you are finding that it was motivated by uh, a certain animus against a protected class, uh, th this is constitutional and it is permissible. Uh, and again, many states around the country following that ruling have enacted these types of statutes and we are in line with uh, the vast majority of jurisdictions of having something like this. Wisconsin versus Mitchell's key point was that we are, the way this statute operates, we are by definition talking about activity that is unprotected. We're talking about crimes. You can't bring this hate crime charge without there having been a crime in order for this enhancement to take place in terms of section one of this, of this bill. Um, so we're already talking about, con we're talking only about constitutionally unprotected activity by definition. Criminal activity, you know, proven charges of criminal activity that is not uh, constitutionally protected. And that does open the doorway to being able to uh, enhance penalties or add on to penalties in the way that this statute already does in Vermont's current law and will continue to do uh, going forward. The, Wisconsin, the court in Mitchell pointed out that states have an interest in punishing this type of behavior more harshly. They said, and, and we agree with that concept. Um, the interest is that, you know, bias inspired conduct uh, is thought to inflict greater individual and societal harm. Uh, according to many of the people who briefed that case, the Wisconsin versus Mitchell case, bias motivated crimes are more likely to provoke retaliatory crimes, inflict emotional harms on their victims and incite community unrest. And, and those, the court in those cases were, was drawing from amicus briefs filed by entities like the American Defamation League and the uh, American Civil Liberties Union in, in making those points. I would add to that, that these crimes commit, uh, engender a broad community harm because other people who share these characteristics uh, will feel threatened in ways that purely personal violence uh, may not uh, have the same type of broader community harms, which is not to say that any violence is okay and doesn't inflict community harm. Of course, it's do it does. That's why they are brought to criminal court. But these have a particular uh, harm uh, across a broader spectrum. And for that reason, the state does have a valid interest in being able to hold people to account for that and punish more harshly and hopefully deter that behavior in the future and tell those communities that we take these things seriously uh, and we are doing what we can. We're using all the tools that we have to try to deter that behavior and to protect those communities who are defined as protected classes under our law. A couple additional points I wanted to make. Um, the statute in Wisconsin versus Mitchell is what you might call a victim selection statute, the particular uh, action that it increased the penalty for was uh, the, the choice of victim. That's narrower than what our statute does. And frankly, it's narrow. There, there are other victim selection statutes on the books around the country, but it's narrow, narrower than what many of the statutes, these hate crime statutes are. And we do not believe that Wisconsin versus Mitchell is limited to simply victim protection, uh, sorry, victim selection statutes, but that its logic does apply a little bit more broadly to actions that are motivated by somebody's identity. It may not be that the sort of act, the violence, whatever it might be, happens uh, solely as a result of choosing somebody as a victim. It may have happened because let's imagine an altercation in a bar or something like that. Somebody says something to somebody else and the response that's called forth, uh, the, perhaps a violent response that constitutes as an assault of some kind, is called forth to a degree and to a level that would not have happened had the person not um, had a certain protected characteristic. And that's not really victim selection uh, or it you know, would be would be more difficult to argue that because these this is an interaction that happened between two people, uh, and it 
it was really the escalation to a certain level of, to a, to a criminal level that resulted from the bias motivation. And for that reason, uh, having a slightly broader definition than victim selection is important in order to encompass the behavior that should be deterred and held to account. And we do think that that is constitutionally permissible. Again, we're, we, would, we are not on our own by any means uh, by having a statute constructed like that. Uh, and, we, and we are confident we're on secure constitutional grounds. Now, I do not believe any statute like this has been overturned. Um, and the final point I wanna make is that there are, anticipating some of the other points that might be made here this morning, there are there is a Supreme Court case that notes that not any uh, biased thoughts can that somebody might have, sort of hate motivated thoughts or actions that somebody might have, can be used to enhance sentencing. And that, of course, is true. Sentencing can't be used to punish, you know, just anything that might be in somebody's head. It does have to be limited to the motivation for uh, why this crime occurred or the severity with which it occurred. And so it is limited in that way. And I'm referring to a, a case called Dawes. And th so that's true, I wanna note that, but what the Wisconsin v. Mitchell case made clear and, and distinguished itself from Dawes in saying that we're talking here about uh, what the motivation was for the crime that occurred and for which there's a conviction. So we don't believe that there's any sort of issue with that. It is clear that you couldn't, a, a prosecutor couldn't say, well, I heard that this guy um, is a member of the of some hateful group. Um, and for that reason, we should punish this person more. That wouldn't really hold water unless there was a really specific connection to them, to why the person behaved the way they did um, in the specific instance that we're talking about. So, I, I, but that is in fact uh, permissible to punish more harshly as this, this um, statute already does and, and proposes to do a little bit more smoothly. And again, we do believe that the in whole or in part concept that's embodied in subsection B here and the proposed subsection B is reasonable and actually important in the way that the law is, the direction in which the law is moving in other states. And again, to hold people to account for this type of harmful behavior, we believe it's important uh, and reasonable and constitutionally appropriate to move in that direction ourselves. May I ask David a question? Sure. David, when I was reading this, two things popped out at me. Um, I think Philip's going to ask you about the word substantial, but um, should we should we be using the term sex or should we be using gender now? And um, is immigration status covered? So we use both uh, sex and gender identity. And I think that that's appropriate. I, I do think for things like this, having the same list of protected characteristics throughout the Vermont statutes as consistently as possible makes sense. Um, this borrows from lists, that, well, I don't, I don't know which came first. I, I couldn't testify to that, but this is in line with other uh, areas of Vermont law, both civil and criminal, where we use the protected class list. And I think that having both sex and gender identity, um, though I do actually, I, let me speak more clearly. I think that those do address different things and mm -hmm. it is important that we have both and we do have both. But gender identity but, isn't in here. It's at the Oh, oh there it is. Oh, I see it's after after the National Guard right. section. I What's see. not I, here I, is what, what I don't think yeah, is here right. and what what is also one of the reasons for the Massachusetts change is the um, immigration status, which Senator White just mentioned. I, that that was uh, in the Massachusetts effort. That's adding immigration status as an effort to combat what is um, an epidemic of Asian, Asian hate crime in the United States. I don't think that we would. Uh, but I, I don't know. It, we need to make sure that that covered by national origin, or should it be? Yes, Senator, I do believe that that would be covered either by national origin or by ancestry. 
those particular issues. That being said, I'd certainly, I, I would actually want to check back that when you get an immigration status, there's a number of complexities that start coming into play and I'd want to check back on that. But that specific issue, I do think is covered by uh, national origin and or and ancestry. The article I had sent to Bryn, I you know, had, that's where that section B comes from. Um, Do want to make I, Senator White just reminded me that I did want to make sure we covered national origin. Senator Benning. Yeah, but I'm, I'm struggling with how this language appears to be watering down the initial hurdle for a prosecution. Let's assume, for whatever reason, I've cheated you out of $100 and you now walk up to me and start pummeling me as a result. And at the very end of your pummeling, you scream, you stupid papist Mick. Uh, you've just made a statement. Um, and the way that I'm reading B, for your making that statement, you're now subject to an enhanced penalty. Do you read that the same way I'm reading it? It may be the case that you are in, in a case like that, it, but it would be hard to, again, some of these things are going to come down to challenging issues of proof. Um, and it's not necessarily going to be easy in, in any of these cases to, uh, to show definitively that the motivation was your identity and identity that's one of these protected characteristics. Uh, so in a case like that, the one you bring up, it may be that, that other facts can show that the intensity of the response that was called forth or the fact that you resorted to a violent response was because of your, or, or sorry, your assailer's uh, understanding of who you have your identity as part of these, some of those are part of these protected classes. Uh, but it may be the case that, um, a jury finds that, in fact, that was just sort of an additional insult tossed on at the end that didn't really, you know, they would have beaten you up anyway. Um, so it's possible that the way the facts come out and the specific ways in which things happen, what may have been said by this person before an attack, all those things are going to come into play in terms of actually whether this is provable as being motivated by that. Uh, it may, like I said, it may also be the case that as it comes out, a jury decides, well, it was an additional insult, but we can't really find the proof to show that this was motivated whole or in whole or in part by uh, your by the dislike for these certain categories. It almost seems to me, though, that B is almost eliminating. I mean, I see the word motivated in A, but when you say it doesn't have to be substantial or predominant or the sole reason, you're implying that it doesn't really have to rise to anything other than a statement that could be perceived by a jury as possibly motivating the offense. I guess I'm just trying to play that out in my head and I'll wait to hear from other people, but that's just something I'm thinking about. Appreciate that, but I think the effort here is to make I take my effort in changing this based upon what's going on in Massachusetts is to try to make hate crimes work. Here in, in Vermont, we've seen cases of pretty vicious behaviors and no charges could be brought. Well, they weren't um, necessarily violent, certainly the trolling, the hate motivated speech, the, um, all the things that we saw, at least in Bennington County with former Representative Morris, um, weren't able to be prosecuted because of the current status of our hate crime laws. And um, so that's the goal, whether B is the right way to get there or not. The goal is to be able to actually um, you know, to make a change in the way we perceive um, behaviors um, that... Uh, I, I understand, Dick, and I support the concept. I just don't want to go too far in the other direction 
and I'm trying to figure out in my own head how you would word this. I, I had actually looked at A and thought it would be somewhat better um, if who's where it, line 10 says attempts to commit any crime or whose conduct is motivated at least in part by the victim's actual or perceived da 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 and eliminate B altogether. Um, but it just seems to me that B is, is giving an extra oomph to my concern. If I could, Mr. Chair, jump yep. in there. So I'm kind of on a similar track with Joe in terms of how it might be edited. I like David's suggestion of in whole or in part. So I think if under A, we said whose, whose conduct is motivated in whole or in part by dot, 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 we left B, but removed substantial. Um, so you'd have above the idea that it doesn't need to be in whole, could be in part, but, and, and then down below, you'd say it doesn't have to be predominant or sole. But what I like about the language David was using is it's, it's, uh, it's, it's yeah. framed in, the, in the, the positive way. So this is what it, what it is in whole or in part motivated by. And what, what I'm stuck on with B is it's negative. It, it doesn't need to be substantial. And that seems to me to point directly to the idea that it could be insubstantial. So um, both the reverse framing and the word substantial, I just don't like. But if you got rid of substantial and put in in whole or in part above, I, I think. I'm, I'm fine with that. I'm just, I'm just raising some issues here so that we yep. can, um, the level of vitriol in this country and to some yeah. extent in the state regarding um, needs to needs to change, and it's not going to change unless we change some of our laws. I'm not out to unconstitutionally take away the right to free speech. I agree with Philip in the direction he's taking it. Okay. Well, David, did you have anything further? We kind oh, of talked over I you, appreciate unfortunately. Um, no, I, I, I- Kind of marking up the bill as we speak. Right, and I, I don't have any uh, major additions here. I would just note, I uh, appreciate the discussion around the in whole or in part and happy to help as, as it needs to go forward. And we do think it is important just to note again that the reality of how these things play out is that they are rarely, it is unusual for that to be the sole motivator. It, it seems to be happening in some cases uh, around the country, but the way these things play out as a matter of reality is that it is part of what's going on. And so we do think that addition is important and we appreciate the committee uh, tackling that uh, and, and including that in the statute. Trying to hear from the other side <clears throat> with our limited Excuse me, the limited time we have this morning, uh, because we need to try to get to um, the appropriations process of our discussions, um, hopefully by 11.15, uh, not sooner. Um, I wonder if I could jump to Rebecca Turner, Supervising Attorney of the Appellate Division, the Office of the Attorney General, and then pick up a sent from John Campbell. Good morning. Good morning, Rebecca. Good morning. Uh, good morning. Uh, for the record, Rebecca Turner from uh, Appellate Division, Office of the Defender General. My camera's a bit off today. Uh, thank you for uh, moving me up, Senator Sears, to just express uh, our reaction to this bill. And I just am looking at the draft language in draft number 1.2 and trying to absorb and adjust. Um, but I think I can, can provide some detailed uh, reactions to, to uh, give you some additional thinking. And, and again, uh, this is preface with an overall, I was prepared to come in and explain um, why the Office of the Defender General objects to the proposed uh, bill as it came out of the House 
uh, that opposition continues with this latest draft 1.2. And let me just jump to why, because uh, why we oppose it in the first place, it, it, and it is exacerbated. The reasons why are even more marked with a, with a new proposal. Um, first, I heard uh, Attorney Scher talk about how our Vermont statute is in line with other state hate crime statutes, sentencing enhancement statutes in the federal law. Let me just correct that. It is not in line in two significant aspects. First, intent is not a requirement for, uh, on the part of proof of the prosecution, meaning that there is no requirement in this 1455 currently, and certainly as the proposed amendment would drop maliciously, and certainly as Senator Benning and, and um, as has talked about, Senator Baruth, also in terms of concerns that this additional language even dilutes further any um, any requirement as to what is going on in the person's mind. Uh, again, any level of mens rea, uh, mens rea and intent is not the same as motivated. Maliciously, arguably, arguably is where you get an intent element. Again, our Vermont statute is striking in that it does not have a willful uh, intent requirement, as does the federal counterpart. Title 18 USC 249, as well as the Wisconsin statute that was addressed um, in Wisconsin v. Mitchell. And uh, Attorney Scher acknowledged that, acknowledged that that was a narrower statute than the one here. He talked about it about narrow in terms of purposefully or the connection of targeting, uh, selecting the victim. <clears throat> but I also want to point out that there's a purposeful, there's a mens rea requirement there. So that is significant difference. Um, the other second significant difference is that our sentencing enhancement statute applies to any crime. And so it is not limited. Uh, and by way, that means it's not limited to crimes involving physical conduct. It does not just limit itself to um, assault crimes, murder, et cetera. It, it applies to pure speech crimes. Now, why that's significant is that both of those reasons, the lack of a mens rea, the lack of a narrowing component applicable just to crimes involving physical conduct, again, distinguishing features uh, from the federal statute and um, what was at issue in Wisconsin v. Mitchell. Again, 18 USC 249, federal, hate crime statute requires physical conduct as well as an intent. So that's huge. It's huge for purposes of surviving constitutional challenge under the First Amendment. Uh, Attorney Scher suggested or said that this, um, this statute satisfies uh, and constitutional First Amendment concerns, but as recently as 2016, 17, and uh, in a decision in 2018 of our Vermont Supreme Court, I challenged the facial validity of the sentencing um, enhancement statute under First Amendment grounds. But for the fact that we went on other grounds, the Supreme Court did not address my uh, constitutional challenge. Um, and my, my challenge there was again based on a lack of a mens rea and the, uh, and the application to pure speech crimes. Now, Attorney Scher said that not all crimes are protected by the First Amendment. Not all speech is protected by the First Amendment. Certainly, uh, this committee has heard uh, plenty of testimony around the First Amendment to understand that there are certain unprotected categories. But what is also further nuanced is even within unprotected categories of speech, fighting words, for instance, truth threats, there cannot be uh, selective and increased uh, punishment based on the particular ideas expressed within the unprotected speech. So hate crimes, you cannot elevate certain particularly hateful thoughts and still survive First Amendment um, challenges. Again, that is a case by RAV, um, the City of St. Paul, 1992 US Supreme Court case that I did not hear uh, mentioned today. So those are the two overwhelming reasons why uh, I've, the, our office has had uh, concerns with this statute. 
I understand the motivation behind this current statute. I was just trying to pull up the Massachusetts proposed bill because I wasn't aware of what's been going on there to see how closely this new language tracks with that. Uh, but again, the concerns raised earlier are just heightening my concerns, which is that merely uh, not requiring uh, a direct link, meaning the defendant chose the complainant because, um, because of the, the purposeful or intent behind knowing that that person was falling within one of these groups under 1455 is the problem here. It clearly uh, permits um, that to not be a strong link or connection. Now, the US Supreme Court, when it considered Wisconsin v. Mitchell and upheld that uh, sentencing enhancement there, it involved a black defendant who was sentenced to death for murdering a white male complainant. And there it was challenged. He challenged it under First Amendment grounds. And the US Supreme Court upheld his death sentence um, because uh, they found that there was the requisite intent. And again, that crime involved physical conduct. In that decision, they, they considered another decision they had done. And that is Barkley, no, that is uh, Doris Dawson, Dawson v. Delaware, 1992 case. And there, they struck down a sentence. And there, it involved a white defendant who was subject to a sentencing enhancement based on a hate crime. And there was struck down as violating the First Amendment because uh, the connection between his hateful, bigoted beliefs. There, Dawson was uh, the facts set established that he was a member of a white supremacy uh, gang while in prison. And the US Supreme Court said that there wasn't a sufficient link between his beliefs, which are perhaps unconscionable and hateful and, and not defendable by, by many people, um, but were otherwise not linked to the underlying conviction uh, and where he was being subject to sentence. And that's where the Supreme Court said that the First Amendment prohibits this uh, sentencing enhancement on hateful, bigoted thoughts. Uh, and so that that is. Just, I'm sorry nope, for the fine. interruption. The other thing I wanted to bring to the attention of this committee um, is at the heart of this is not about someone escaping conviction. There are, there are all the crimes already on the books to ch prosecute and convict and get a sentence for conduct. The judge already has within his or her discretion to impose a sentence higher or lower based on the underlying circumstances, including if there's uh, information before the judge at the time of sentencing, a hateful circumstances, hateful motivated conduct. So that is there. So the issue here is what is the purpose served of subjecting a particular type of crime um, to lengthier terms of imprisonment. Now I've heard here this morning that there, the goal would be to try to address, to, to try to, I think, presumably lower the, the, the challenges on behalf of the prosecution uh, to meet these requirements. Therefore, presumably more people would be subject to the sentencing enhancements and then the question is what next? What we do know and, uh, is that the studies have shown that lengthier sentences do not mean that deterrence follows. That is significant if the point here is to try to deter future hate crimes. If lengthier sentences do not deter, do not effectively rehabilitate a defendant or person to come back out and not be uh, subsequently hateful uh, and bigoted, then what are we doing in this, um, in this moment when so much has to be done? And I readily agree that, that uh, there are so many um, events that we read about every single day 
that just reminds us how much needs to be fixed. This statue does not fix this. We know that these statutes have been on the books for years and years and years. We know that community members do not feel safe uh, in terms of self-reporting crimes to law enforcement. Uh, so I don't see how fixing a very specific end of it will solve anything, particularly since not only do we have a reporting issue and trust with law enforcement, we don't, and we, at the end of the, of the other end of it, we don't know, actually we do know, lengthier terms of imprisonment do not deter crime. Uh, I was just reading one study uh, possibly supports increased uh, uh, likelihood of crime. We know that, that if there is a conviction and sentence secured, that it will be subject to considerable challenges in litigation uh, because it is this proposal, the current statute on the books violates the First Amendment. And I'll, I'll stop here because I, I understand that the committee's time is short. And well, that, I'm sorry for my interruption. Um, part of Zoom is you're at home and you have things happen. And, uh, Tend to them. I apologize. Um, any questions for Rebecca? I think you've been fairly clear, and I'm sorry I missed part of your testimony. The good thing about Zoom, a lot of bad things about it. One of the good things is I can catch up. Um, oh. Senator White. So I'm just, um, I guess I when you talked about that it wasn't limited to crimes of physical. Um, confrontation or um, violence that is um, how do how do we um, create a crime that isn't I, I got a little confused at that point because um, if speech isn't really a crime so am I confused here well, I, I think what, what you're teasing out is that there are criminal statutes on the books that criminalize speech. Um, and I'm trying to read, is it, is it the uh, threatening? Yeah. Um, threatening, oh, <laughs> threatening speech. It's, it's fairly new and I'm, I'm just blanking on it for the moment. And you're right that, uh, that there has been heavy litigation in this area in terms of when speech itself is the target of the crime. Can it be criminalized under the First Amendment? And the answer is yes, if, right? <laughs> yes, if. First, uh, on survive a facial challenge, is it targeting uh, an unprotected category of speech? Is it a fighting words, uh, unprotected speech category? We, we can take disorderly conduct, um, subsection in, in disorderly conduct, the US, the Vermont Supreme Court interpreted in State v. Tracy, again, one of my cases that that just targeted fighting words, an un, a long historically recognized category of unprotected speech, very narrowly defined. It's very difficult to find what, what kind of speech falls within there, but it is there. Now, what we have overlaying that is this RAV versus City of St. Paul US Supreme Court decision, 1992. And there, they, there they've reviewed a Wisconsin. Um, I'm, I'm sorry, it was St. Paul. So it's it, city of St. Paul. It must be Minnesota. It was they were reviewing fighting words and the and the law that selectively punished particular types, particularly types and ideas of fighting words, and the U.S. Supreme Court made clear that when you selectively punish based on the content of within a category of unprotected speech, the First Amendment is implicated again and prohibits that. So it's not a free zone to just um, legislate freely within the categories of unprotected speech is what I'm trying to say. And so that's where we're at with this situation, which is the hate crime statute and sentencing enhancement statute captures uh, speech crimes, which assuming they survive uh, a First Amendment challenge there, right, 
then we have this the second part of that, which is that now, uh, if it was content neutral in the first place, assuming it was, but maybe it wasn't, we've got now very content based uh, selection of why this particular speech crime is being subject to a sentencing enhancement. That implicates the First Amendment. So, oh, can I follow up? Just follow up. Yeah, on? please. So, if if the um, if our enhanced um, penalty for hate crime was limited to physical confrontations, would is that something you would also oppose or um, not? have a, an opinion on or, um, but it, it's mainly the speech issue that you're concerned about. Is that right? And, and, and the mens rea, the lack of mens rea. Yeah. And, and, okay. and the fact that this isn't limited to um, physical conduct. Yeah. And again, taking a look at Title 18 USC Section 249, the federal counterpart to it, uh, where the committee discussions when they were talking about that raised these exact concerns in terms of if they didn't anchor it to uh, uh, physical conduct and um, intent that the, that the First Amendment issues would be there. But, but certainly, you know, would, if those changes happened, uh, would we still oppose this bill? And, I, I, and, and, and again, yes, this is a sentencing enhancement statute that doesn't serve to effectively deter future hate crimes based on what we know on studies of lengthier imprisonment. I understand the instinct to act harshly here in terms of a, a position of not tolerating racism. Absolutely, it is intolerable. And I, and I don't mean to reduce this to just racism. I understand that this hate, uh, hate crime statute is much broader, obviously, beyond race. Uh, but there is no room to tolerate hate. This statute doesn't deter that those future hate crimes from happening. Thank you. Thank you. Um, I was struck, I drove down to towns of Mass to awake on Monday afternoon. And I was struck by a house that had an American flag, a Confederate flag, a Trump flag, and a don't tread on me flag. Others that may be repugnant to me, it may have troubled me to see that. Obviously, I saw it both ways coming and going. And wondered about the resident of that home and how they feel about that. <clears throat> but if that person continually harasses an individual, a person of color, let's say, and continually harasses them, continually does things that basically drive them out of town. Isn't there some recourse? Shouldn't there be, excuse me, isn't, I shouldn't say isn't. Shouldn't there be some recourse for that individual who has been now harmed by that person, hasn't been struck, hasn't been um, assaulted? But that, I guess that's my question. Um, if, if you're, I'm sorry, is there recourse? I think that that if, if it falls within a criminal code, there is the criminal consequences recourse and, and the prosecution can, can charge accordingly. Uh, I think that there are uh, certainly harassment related um, types of crimes on the books right now. Um, I mean, there is, there is the speech crime uh, statute I just referenced. And uh, so it is not about the non-existence of a current crime, there is no, there isn't an insufficient number of crimes available, is I guess what I'm saying. Again, here, the issue is about sentencing enhancement. Uh, what you are, are pointing to in terms of the particular circumstances involved, again, judge is free and, and, and will sentence up accordingly if presented with the proper uh, information supporting it and it otherwise supports such a sentence. So I, I do think the current system is, is set up to already address and accommodate this. It is, it is not an issue of whether or not uh, not passing this bill is about 
not recognizing that there needs to be change. This is just looking at what is what is being done here, okay? trying to make it easier to impose uh, longer prison and sen uh, prison sentences is just not going to achieve um, deterrence of future hate crimes. And, and I think that's what is the hard reality. Um, and I think that efforts should be considered and looked, uh, looked at elsewhere in terms of how to address systemic racism, uh, racism in individual cases uh, or other bigoted hateful uh, incidents. I'm trying to mute myself with a telephone ringing another uh, it's unfortunate that my registration is soon running, uh, my warrant is soon running out and they're not going to call again and I missed the call. Um, is there any other questions for Rebecca? Thank you very much, Rebecca. John Campbell, um, and we're going to um, stop at 11.15 so that we can take up um, the one-time appropriations. <clears throat> Hopefully we'll get to the ACLU and talk. Thank you, Mr. Chair. I'll be, I'll be very brief because I know time is short. And uh, I just got that same phone call, by the way, even though I have a new car, but um, we'll talk about that later. Well, you're not going to get called again. I know. I'm, I'm really upset about that. Um, you know, one thing I just must say, what, what, what Rebecca said and just said, and I, I really kind of agree with her as far as a deterrent effect. You know, we, we in this country, we, we got to wake up. We've got to decide if we can you know, that, or realize that you know, if, if we're going to move forward as a as a race and as a as a country, um, you know, we have to learn how to, to live together to get along. And um, you know, the continuation of what you were just explaining about you know, this obnoxious and insensitive behavior, like having those Confederate flags flying out there. Um, you know, the uh, and it actually goes to this: is that this this type of uh, of uh, these laws is that. You know, no, that by itself is not a, is not a crime uh, unless there's something specific to that town, um, but ordinance. But it's not a crime. But w if that person, you know, commits a battery on somebody, you know, that uh, those flags and his or her uh, being part of organizations or their speech that helps to show the motivation um, and whether it was in fact uh, supported by, you know, the crime was uh, motivated by that bias. So uh, again, I, I don't want to take time. So what David, I agree with uh, David shares testimony uh, today. Uh, I do believe also that it would be beneficial to have that the language change with the whole in part. Um, I think it, it, uh, it clarifies it. I think it would make it a lot easier for, for us, uh, for the prosecutors to, uh, to handle these cases. Uh, so I, uh, I will leave it at that unless there are any questions. Well, I, d I do want to make clear when I mentioned the house with the flag and the, with the four flags and was not, um, uh, that person has committed no crime. They have a right to their um, views and their speech. So while it might be repugnant to me, it is when that person goes a step further and continually harasses somebody to drive them out of a community based upon their gender, national origin, ancestry, et cetera. And, and that's important because I think that's really what we have to understand here. This is an enhancement to the crime. So right. the underlying crime has to be committed and, um, and proven. And once that's proven, if we can show the, that it was motivated, motivated by this bias, then you, you can go for the enhancement there. Um, so, and, I, and we are, uh, I think there are other states that have uh, similar uh, uh, provisions in their statutes. So I, I believe this would, would uh, survive a constitutional challenge. Senator White, did you have a question for Senator? I, I for, did. For um, John Campbell. For John. Um, so um, you said that it would make it easier to prosecute, but it doesn't make it easier to prosecute because you have to, when you prosecute, you have to do, you have to prove it one way or the other. This this says once once the person is found guilty, then you can add an extra sentence on them. But it doesn't have anything to do with the prosecution. Am I wrong? No, you're not wrong. I, I I'm talking about the motivation, the enhancement aspect of that. But that doesn't affect the prosecution. You can't bring That's that. How, well, but it's how you prove that 
heightened crime. But wait, so do you use it in the prosecution also, or do you use it in the sentencing? The, as far as, let me be clear, because I'm confused now. What, what, which one are we talking about? Well, if, if you, in order to prove that a crime has been committed, mm -hmm. you, have, you have to prove that a crime has been committed, whatever that crime is. If it's a um, unprotected yeah. speech like disorderly conduct, or if it's beating up on somebody, you have to prove that that um, happened. Mm -hmm. And is part of your proof that it was motivated by hate, or do you have to prove it on its own? And then when it comes to sentencing, you say, but it was motivated by hate, so we can add, have an additional sentence. It's That's additional, my question. Right, it's the additional sentence where the enhancement is when you make the argument that it was motivated by um, this, this uh, hate or bias you know, toward the, uh, and then go through the different categories. Okay, but that it doesn't have anything to do with the prosecution itself. No, not no, not for the underlying crime. Thank you, David. Did you want to comment? Just to that point directly, I, I, if I understand the question correctly, I wanted to clarify one piece, which is that a uh, allegations that, if proven, would bring a sentence above the statutory maximum for the underlying offense. Sure. do need to be taken to a jury. A judge can't find those independently if you are going to punish somebody beyond the statutory maximum for the underlying offense. So I do believe that, you know, 13 VSA 1455 is going, it does have to go in front of a jury to be proven uh, because if it didn't and you tried to sentence somebody beyond the statutory maximum of the underlying crime, that would be unconstitutional. I think it's the Apprendi case is the U.S. Supreme Court case. Uh, so hopefully that provides clarification if I understood your question. I think it does. You have to, so you have to bring it up. You have to bring up the motivation during the trial itself, during the prosecution itself, in order to prove that there should be an enhanced penalty. Um, Rebecca Turner, would you like to comment? It, it, it's a think of it as is the, the the trial guilt phase. And the process, the burden on the prosecution is the same, regardless. Only when you get to a guilty verdict, you move to sentencing. What attorney Sher is saying is that then on the separate point that elevates this for an enhanced sentence, a jury would have to be brought in, but that's a sentencing stage of it. So you, so Senator Waite, my understanding of your questions, you, you are correct that this change will not result in making prosecutions for the underlying criminal offense any easier. That will remain unchanged. It is about making it easier to get an enhanced sentence at the sentencing stage. Uh, okay, got it. Thank you. Okay, thank you. You've got about five minutes left, um, and I don't want to rush um, Malco's uh, testimony. Um, but I'd be happy to come back at another time if that's what works for the committee. I think that's probably the best course of action um, today. Uh, we will take this bill up next week sometime, if there is a next week. Um, and by that, I mean for the legislative committees. Um, we still haven't heard. I believe that we will have another before we have to get all the bills up. Uh, I'm still waiting for confirmation from them. Unless we've got the schedule later this week. Peggy, do we have? Oh, 10 15 on Friday. We'll take this up again. Yep, I was just going to say we have a little bit of time. Yeah, 10 15 on Friday. Okay. Happy to see you all then. <laughs> okay, great. Thank you. Um, we, you don't need to go off YouTube, Peggy, but we'll take a three minute break. Uh, or if you want to go off, you can and come back. Um, I don't know how hard that is. We're I gonna think take we'll go a, off. Better not to take chances. <laughs> okay. Well, we're going to take a three minute break. Be back at 10 15.